Hi everybody, Chow Wei here from the Singapore General Hospital. I'm from the Department of Vascular and Interventional Radiology. And today we'll be talking about IRs as pain positions and how the hybrid CT will get us there. These are my disclosures. Now, um, I'm sure as uh, you know, as you are in your own everyday practice or when you're attending conferences, MSK and pain inventions are growing, whether it is cementoplasty, vertebral stenting, ablations, embolizations, nerve blocks, or a combination of the above. And we do know that the scale of the problem is immense. Uh, bone is the most common site of secondary metastases after the lung and the liver. And it is where a lot of patients have a lot of disabilities uh, when they are suffering from cancer. And the changing landscape of oncology means that while treatments are getting better, patients are also living longer and therefore more susceptible to painful lesions. Now, these painful lesions may not be life-limiting, but they can be debilitating. Now, there are already a lot of players in this arena. There's orthopedics, radiation oncology, palliative medicine, and pain anesthesia. The question is then, is there still a role for IR? And today, we are trying to convince you that there is. Now, for pain and palliation in the cancer patients, we're looking at axial skeleton metastases. We treat a lot of pain. Uh, sometimes we treat patients who require augmentation before uh, radiation. We treat various visceral pain as well. And other palliative measures, for example, gastrostomies, venting stomas, GI stenting, and SVC stenting. Now, all this is well within uh, the uh, armatorium of the intervention radiologist. Now, for MSK uh, issues, most of our MSK practice is in the realm of cancer, as for example, this metastatic lung cancer lesion here uh, that is encroaching the adjacent rib as well as the spine. Now, because this is a thoracic spine, uh, we tend to be a little bit more aggressive with these ablations, as you can see this cryoablation. Uh, we really do not care about the intercostal nerve uh, because they do not uh, supply any meaningful movement and probably uh, only get a uh, surprise a sensory uh, to the rib cage uh, that the patient will feel. Uh, for this, we do the patient uh, under local anesthesia, checking the size of the ice ball as well as the movement of the leg to ensure a safe uh, ablation. Now, why IR for MSK interventions? Now, this is really a natural extension of what we do in interventional oncology. We're drawing upon skills sets in embolization, sclerotherapy, image-guided uh, targeting, as well as ablation. So these are skills that we know. We are just moving them to another arena for the benefits of our existing patients. And of course, very importantly, uh, we know how to use and understand cutting edge uh, imaging. Here in SGH, we have MDT for bone pain and spine. And this is a weekly conference uh, attended by palliative physicians, DRO, medical oncologists, spine surgeons, and IRs. We even have a dedicated group chat on the secure chat system for fire, quick fire consults. Um, this is our schema on how we treat uh, spinal metastasis here in SGH. First of all, we divide the patient according to prognosis. Certainly, if the uh, patient uh, is living longer uh, with few disease, you know, surgical uh, decompression and fixation is probably the best. However, as you can see, when the patient um, uh, is not doing very well, and that's where we offer RT. For patients with osteoporotic, uh, sorry, with uh, malignant uh, vertebral compression fractures, one of the best ways to treat pain is with vertebral augmentation. And we're going to talk a little bit about the evidence later. As you can see as well, uh, we rely on the SIN score, and we're also going to talk about it later. So this gives us a, a, a good way for the various doctors or the various disciplines to come together and have a good common understanding. CAFE trial, balloon kyphoplasty versus non-surgical management for treatment of painful vertebral body metastasis compression fractures is level one evidence in this area. This is a RCT kyphoplasty versus conservative treatment for malignant uh, vertebral compression fractures, measuring functional scores at one month. As you can see for kyphoplasty, there is a clear um, significant decrease uh, in the pain score, whereas for the conservative treatment, there's hardly any changes at all. For SIN scores, this is both a radiological as well as a clinical scoring to tell uh, chiefly here, both the surgeons, the radiation oncologists and the intervention oncologists on how unstable the malignant spine disease is. And this has uh, uh, various factors like location, 
pain, whether it is osteolytic, osteoblastic lesion, and how's the alignment like, etc. From scores 0 to 6, this is a stable spine. 7 to 12 is a potentially unstable spine, and this is where we will start offering vertebral augmentation before radiation, especially if we're going to give high dose. 13 to 18, and this is an unstable spine, and sometimes these really need uh, surgical consults. During these rounds at IRs, how do we add value? We go through the images. We identify the various pain generators, which may or may not be mentioned in the oncologically focused reports. We do know that the focus of the report is to see which tumors are bigger and smaller, but sometimes small fractures uh, that is causing a lot of pain are not mentioned, and this is where we, we look at based on the clinical input by our colleagues. But of course, we have to examine the patient for the location of pain as well. And then we offer treatment modalities tailored to the nature of the disease. Uh, and also we see what other methods uh, of treatment are available, life expectancy and the patient's wishes. That we need to also make a distinction between whether we want to treat the pain versus treating the tumor. So for example, if there is a right chest wall lesion uh, because of metastasis to the rib, to treat the pain, a quick, uh, a fast and dirty way is to just ablate the corresponding intercostal nerve. Whereas if we want to go for local regional treatment because we think that the patient can benefit, we'll go ahead and ablate the tumor. So another example that I'd like to say that if you have an L1 you know, a uh, uh, vertebral spinal compression fracture, malignant, mild canal stenosis, significant pain, poorly controlled meds, uh, what you do. Now, if this is non small cell lung cancer, has it never been treated before, uh, minimal other disease, it may be a good candidate for surgery. In the same uh, tumor in a patient with significant other disease burden, you know, who has not seen radiation therapy, will offer cement and then RT. It's really because the cementoplasty, as you can see from the CAFE trial, uh, reduces the pain much quicker than radiation. We do know that radiation does not treat fractures. Now, in the same lesion and in the same kind of cancer, but it was already previously heavily treated with RT, uh, and the radiation oncologists don't really think that there's much more to contribute from their side, we may offer ablation plus cement straight away because we know that you know, already one form of local regional therapy is reaching uh, its uh, best use date. And therefore, as intervention radiologists, we need the best equipment. And a hybrid CT is really the top choice for complex MSK procedures. You get high quality images. You can perform both comb beam CT and MD CT quickly. They're flexible and fast. Uh, and we, especially with the new machine, there is now coordination between the couch, the arm, and the CT scan, so that one imaging done, you can translate to another. Okay, as you can see, fast switching from all of these. And again, you can translate both MDCT and comb beam CT into guidance, whether it's needle guide or ENVO guide. In SGH, uh, we are lucky enough to have two units of this, these. Uh, one recently got, got upgraded. Now, uh, before this new machine comes, the MDCT uh, is the main driver. Uh, of uh, most of our uh, what we do because the home CD component wasn't very strong. So for the new room, we, we started to conceptualize and we construct and, you know, we, and, uh, no effort was spared in planning with uh, uh, the vendor to get the best room possible. And this is now our principal radiographer, uh, the one leading the effort. This is Boon, uh, one of the staff from the vendor side. And essentially, we get a room that we think we like and we work. Now, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, and CT really is the driver. We hardly do any combined CT on the other machine, but now we find that both are great options, and we're going to talk about when maybe we prefer to, to use which. Now, again, both combined CT and MDCT allows needle guidance and envo guidance. Now, which to use when? Um, now, if you're going to do, if you are really going to uh, lean on that 3D and Geogram, uh, you may want to do a comb beam CT, much like our neural colleagues, they are still doing uh, you know, spins of the head because of higher fidelity for the embryo guide. And in the latest uh, machine that we acquired, it's a four second rapid spin you know, with minimal movement. For MDCT, again, we're going back. It is the good soft tissue contrast it is what you want to monitor your eyes for on, sometimes on dual energy. For larger patients who cannot breath hold, certainly the MDCT is going to be much better than chromium CT, and the MDCT has lower radiation dose. Now, uh, now we will demonstrate how we do uh, sacroplasty playing on the comb beam CT. Uh, this is really quite good because you can have challenging anatomy in multiple planes. And this is Dr. Alexander Tan here. After the uh, MDCT, you know, planning out what he wants to do, right? What 
uh, angles you want to do. And then he tilts the gantry because for sacrum, as you see coming from the oblique, we can get through more bone and more tumor in the way. And then we land two needles in, and after which we straight away uh, go to fluoroscopy, right? Because we want to do our injection under constant imaging. So first he starts uh, with the uh, patient's left side, you know, multi -plane, multiple planes. Uh, with sacroplasty, the most important thing when you're injecting cements is that you do not want a medial leak into the foramen. You also don't want an anterior leak, and that's where some of the lumbar plexus is. So you can see we want it in multiple planes, lateral, AP, and we then do, you know, after we remove the needles and then that's it. So you can see the flexibility of a hybrid CT really allows us uh, the best way to treat such diseases. Now, this is an acetabular lesion that we treated on foam beam CT. As you can see, after a foam beam CT is done, again, our trajectory is uh, 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 met out. You know, we go from the bullseye view to the progression view. Uh, these will be... Uh, appear on your frost free screen to guide you. And finally, uh, once the trajectory is correct, it is very simple then is to just drill down into the correct spot and then to give cement later. This is an example of a T12 vertebral body sending. So the indication here is really we want the best height restoration. And this is someone who's active and in kyphosis and the toracal lumbar junction. And this is a great indication for vertebral body stenting. Sometimes when we are worried about a cement leak, it can also be quite important as well so that we can inject that cement. Now the advantages of the MDCT here is that your measurements are going to be precise. Your trajectory planning is going to be precise. So then you can then uh, calculate what is the best implant size to use, and you can also have a good uh, appreciation of trajectory on the volume scan. Again, as we see here, this is how we plan our trajectory by particular approach. Now, normally I favor intercostal vertebral approach for thoracic spine, and because this patient has very good size T12 pedicles, we decided to go with the pedicle instead. As you can see in the volume scan, it tells you exactly where your needle is going to go, and this is especially true when you can see the uh, uh, beam hardening artifacts after that. Very, very useful to tell your entire trajectory. And after that, we go on fluoroscopy to open up uh, the stent. As you can see, we get good high elevation here. And after which, we started to inject cement to fill out the spaces uh, in between. Now, one thing that we don't do enough of in IR is for metal suppression artifacts. I mean, our ablation needles, our vertebroplasty needles are all artifacts, right? And sometimes it can be really hard to see underlying anatomy as well as the eye spot, especially if you're doing prior ablation. And this is where SEMA, the single energy metal artifact reduction, really helps us. As you can see, this is a case contributed by Dr. Apuva. This is a uh, localized spread of HCC to the posterior uh, wall. We can see once you this the metal artifact reduction turned on, you get to see the ice ball better with less artifacts. This is where the Combium CT angiogram helped us. This is a spinal embolization. Now for, for the spine, normally it is uh, not too difficult. However, there was this one spot that really cannot cannulate and we decided to go to the Combium CT, which decided to uh, label the origin and sure enough, very quickly, we managed to go in and finish the job. Now, what about ablation? Um, ablation is also very nicely done on the hybrid CT. This is a L3 uh, angiosarcoma. Uh, don't really, uh, has been irradiated before, not responding, very painful. And because the tumor is so big, we decided to offer ablation as well as a cementoplasty to the patient. So first, uh, two needles in for prior ablation. This is quite an aggressive prior ablation. Um, the patient is awake. We ask the patient to move legs all the time to make sure that we're not getting any uh, uh, lower limb compromise, and after which we do it with cement, and the patient's pain got a lot better after that. And this is how we do the process. As you can see, we use clear drapes from the for the leg. This is Dr. Liang Sam, Dr. David Lim, so that we can see the patient's movement during the procedure, and after which we use the same cannula to inject the cement. Another way to do this is under general anesthesia, and you apply uh, uh, neuromonitoring. 
Uh, for this, the anesthetists have to give total intravenous anesthesia. They cannot give gas. And after that, there's a staff. Uh, some of these uh, can be uh, uh, private vendors. And they will tell you uh, if there's a 50% drop or more in certain neurotomes of the leg. And that's when you know you have to stop. So in this case, we decide to use microwave uh, using a protocol, uh, 65 watt for 1.5 minutes. We find it there's a drop. And that's when we stop. We let the patient recover. We decide to do again, but it stop again. After the procedure, there is no neurological deficit and there's great pain relief in this L3. Uh, mats for RCC. So you see these are all the uh, images and the waveforms that we get for the drop in the patient's uh, motor neural function. This is a multidisciplinary and multimodality effort. For example, this 41-year-old foreign patient with Nasty RCC transferred to Singapore. He couldn't walk due to pain. Now he had spine, he has cervical spine metastases. This is his primary RCC. He has a large hip lesion that is really giving him unsteady gait. He can tell you he's walking on clouds, literally. So first, uh, we decided that the surgeon should go ahead first and fix the C6 vertebral body, after which we embolize the lesion in the left hip, and then we injected cement. Uh, you do not have, and the most important portion of the cement is the uh, superior posterior medial, uh, the posterior border, whereby the hip is in, in articulation uh, with the acetabulum to provide support. And this is the patient uh, just a couple of days after the procedure. You know, at least he can walk with a walking stick. So in conclusion, we think that a 40 CT has lots to offer and percutaneous MSK intervention will push the technology to its limits. We need to learn how to drive these new models. Uh, software capability is going to be as important as hardware as if we can see with all the planning guide that we do. And internally, you and your staff will need to work out workflows for both home beam CT and MDCT. But this is really a case of the man and the machine. The machine is alone is not going to be enough to get you there. As IRs, we can and should take the initiative in this new arena uh, for our patients. Uh, what uh, we do not have time to talk about today is how crucial the radiographers uh, are. They now need to learn cutting edge CT home beam and fluoroscopy and really dream work makes the team work. And I think everybody in the team should contribute. And MDTs uh, with your other clinicians are a great way uh, to start this. Uh, thank you very much.